Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Commissary, and we welcome those of you that are watching on Facebook. In a few minutes, when the class is over, we'll have announcements. I will mention just a few here. Scott Giles, we mentioned that he was uh, in the hospital in Memphis, but he's now home. Louise Banks is home, and uh, she's going to have to uh, uh, have a home health care nurse for a while and then do therapy. She said it would be a little while before she uh, gets back here, but she appreciates uh, uh, the prayers that have been offered up on her behalf, uh, so keep her in, in mind. Um, Evan's uh, test uh, will be in, uh, in October. Uh, he's doing, uh, he's not here tonight, but he's doing doing very well, so we're, we're glad with that. Um, Christy Cooper, this was, uh, she has passed away. You may have gotten a, a note on that today in the group text. But uh, she is Ron Hall's daughter, uh, sister of Candace uh, Skinner. And uh, she used to come out here with Ron years ago. You may remember her, but her funeral will be tomorrow at Hope Gardens Funeral Home in uh, Pocahontas. So remember that family in your prayers. Also, Mavis Neely has passed away. We don't know anything about any arrangements that may have been made uh, for her. Uh, she uh, has been living in Louisiana. Uh, does anyone have any information on her? There's no service plan for her. Okay. So re remember that family too in your prayers. Uh, let's go ahead and start our, our class in with a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your many blessings and we confess to you that we don't deserve them, but we're grateful that uh, you love us enough to bless us with your grace and your mercy and your love and father we pray for these that we've mentioned tonight uh, pray for those that are bereaved pray for those that uh, are sick and pray that you'll be with those that are on a prayer list and that uh, you'll uh, be with their caregivers and also their families we pray father that uh, you will be with us tonight as we study from your word we're thankful for jesus we're thankful for your holy spirit we're thankful for the bible thankful for the church and the opportunity we have to be a part of your family and please bless us tonight as we study from the book of revelation help us always to seek to do your will we pray in jesus name amen i want us to uh, look at a few verses tonight outside of the book of Revelation, and if you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, Romans 8. This is one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. I have a favorite verse, if you're allowed to have such, First uh, John 1, 7. Romans 8, though, is uh, a rich chapter. Beginning at verse 31 in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, 
nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when I read those verses, it gives me hope. And uh, we think about all the various things that could happen to us in life, uh, but none of that will separate us from the love of uh, God. And uh, we sometimes, quite often, quit loving God. Lots of things come between us and God, but there is nothing that keeps God from loving us. Uh, and one word that he uses here is tribulation in verse 35, and that's a word that's used uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, we don't normally think of the book of Revelation as a book of hope, but I think it is exactly that. Now uh, turn to 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1. And in 2 Timothy 1, look at verse 12. Here Paul says, if you um, look at verse 11 also, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And we have a song in our book that's based upon that verse. Now go over to the fourth chapter of Second Timothy, And look at verses 16 through 18, 2 Timothy 4, beginning at verse 16. Paul said, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. One thing that we've been stressing uh, in the book of Revelation is that the Lord promises protection to his children. This doesn't mean that we'll not have to suffer for the cause of Christ. Paul made those very bold statements about his Lord, and yet uh, uh, it is believed that uh, he was beheaded in Rome for the cause of Christ. Uh, but the Lord uh, offers us protection through the storm. He doesn't say that we're going to be protected from the storm. Storms will come. Uh, persecutions will arise, uh, hard times will occur, uh, maybe in various forms. It, it might be in sickness, it, it might be in heartache, uh, it could be in uh, some uh, natural disaster, it could be in war, uh, you name them, and, and many things are alluded to in the book, book of Revelation. But we have a God who uh, knows what we're going through. Uh, his son lived here for 33 years and uh, look what he had to go through. He understands and, and he promises that, that he's going to be with us. When Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, uh, he gave the great commission to uh, the remaining apostles and he knew what some of them were going to go through. He even told them that you know they would be uh, persecuted and and that they would even some of them would have to die he said lo I am with you always even to the end of the age uh, Matthew 28 20 Hebrews 13 verse 5 says I'll never leave you or forsake you and uh, we are people of faith uh, if we understand that and we embrace it uh, it gives us hope and the book of Revelation is that uh, book uh, of hope. 
and I hope that we look at it in, in that way. Now, Revelation uh, was written by John. Uh, we believe that this is John the Apostle, the son of uh, Zebedee, the brother of James, written to the seven churches of Asia. Uh, and in chapter one, the seven churches of Asia uh, are described as seven uh, lampstands, or seven candlesticks, some versions say. And in chapter one, Jesus is uh, among the seven churches, among these seven congregations, just like he's among uh, us today. And uh, in the very first uh, verse of Revelation, uh, John states why he wrote these things. He says, this is written to show the things that must soon take place, must soon take place. Uh, he's not uh, going to give a history of what is going to happen from that point to the end of time. He's not going to be talking about Napoleon. He's not going to be talking about uh, Hitler. He's not going to be talking about Saddam Hussein. Uh, he is uh, speaking about problems that face them right then. Now, we may have a, a repeat of history and, and face some of the same things, and therefore we can get some of the same uh, encouragement by reading Revelation. Uh, the seven churches of Asia were located in what today is Turkey. These congregations were Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And as you uh, will recall, when we were studying chapters two and three, uh, Jesus had a certain format in, in place when he wrote to those churches. He would first uh, commend them for the good points, then he would mention what he had against them, and then he would very kindly tell them that they needed to change, needed to repent. He didn't say anything negative about Smyrna, he didn't say anything negative about the church of Philadelphia, and he didn't say anything positive about church at Laodicea. But in those uh, letters, he, he did indicate that some of them had already suffered some persecution, others were going to. And so in chapter four, you have a scene in heaven. And the scene is that God is on his throne. He is in charge, he's still in charge. Uh, he's been in charge through the persecutions that they'd already suffered, he would be in charge with the problems that face him in the future. That's a good lesson for you and me. He's still in charge. And then in chapter five, uh, we have pictured a scroll that's sealed with seven seals. And John said he cried because there was no one that was found worthy to uh, open uh, this scroll, to open these seals to see what was going to be revealed. But then finally, the Lion of Judah, Jesus took the scroll and he began to open the uh, seals. In chapter six, we have six of those uh, seals that are revealed. Um, and uh, the first one is uh, pictured a man on a white horse. And uh, I believe, you don't have to believe what I believe on this. I believe this is a, a picture of Christ. He, he's about to mention some, some bad things. But they need to remember in the, very, uh, in the very outset who's in control. This is Christ, the victor on the white horse, I believe. The second seal is broken and uh, you have pictured a man on a red horse. That very well could represent war, blood. It was in their future. And then the third seal, a uh, man on a black horse could represent famine, uh, which was often one of the results uh, of a war. And then uh, the fourth one, uh, man on a pale horse, uh, which scholars believe represents death. Again, death is a product of, of war. And then you have that fifth seal broken, and you have pictured there the martyrs. A martyr is someone who dies for a cause that he, that he really uh, embraces. Uh, these were uh, people that uh, had died for the cause of Christ. And they're pictured as being under the altar and they're shouting out, how long, how long, how long? 
And we probably have all asked that question. We look at situation in the world today and, and the bad things that are going on and, and we think, how long is the Lord going to, you know, allow this world to exist, you know? And they were saying, how long, God, are you going to permit this to go on? And then the sixth seal is, is broken and uh, it's a, a picture of judgment. Some people think that that's the final judgment. My view, uh, again, which you do not have to uh, have, is that this is judgment upon Rome. Rome is the culprit here. Rome is uh, the one that uh, is wreaking havoc upon uh, the, the church there in the first century and the second century. Uh, and, and there was going to be payday someday for them. And the Lord is promising uh, that. Uh, now the seventh seal um, is not broken until chapter 8, but you have those first six seals broken there in, uh, in chapter 6. And then there's a question in the sixth chapter in verse 17. Who is able to stand? Who is able to survive? And that's not answered until chapter 7, immediately following. And when you get to chapter 7, you have four angels that are standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds. Uh, and they are told to hold these winds, keep them from blowing and destroying, until the servants of God have been sealed. Uh, until the bond servants of God have been sealed. Then they could unleash the, the winds. Uh, and uh, in chapter 7, the servants of God are pictured in, in two ways. Uh, they're uh, described as 144,000. And we've talked about it and uh, different ideas on that. But these are God's servants that are on the earth. These are the ones that are still living. These are the ones uh, that uh, are are going to be uh, protected. They're going to be sealed uh, with God's protection. And then you have a second picture of God's uh, servants. And this time, not 144,000, but the picture is multitudes. And these multitudes uh, are God's servants that have already died and gone to heaven. They're pictured in heaven. They're clothed in white robes. The Bible says that they've come through the great tribulation. Uh, and uh, they are the ones that uh, have, have survived and, and gone on. We get to uh, chapter 8, and uh, the seventh seal is broken, and you have silence in heaven for half an hour. Not sure uh, why. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe showing God's uh, patience. Uh, you know, God doesn't want anyone to perish. Uh, and he doesn't want anyone to lose uh, uh, his soul. And, uh, and so maybe he's just hesitating a little bit there. Uh, the Bible teaches that in a couple of places. There are seven angels there that are given seven trumpets. And there's another angel, the uh, Bible says, who uh, is standing at the altar and he's holding a golden censer. Uh, a censer uh, was a container in, in which... Uh, you would have uh, uh, you you would have incense, uh, and that the incense would be be burned there at the altar. And in the Old Testament, represented prayers of of the saints. Well, there was much incense. The Bible says given to this angel, and he adds that to the prayers of all the saints. So you have the angel there with the censer, uh, and uh, and he's given more uh, incense that's put into the censer. And this is to be added to the prayers uh, that are going to go up to, uh, to God. Uh, and these do all go up in smoke to God. Uh, and you have to understand, this is figurative language. Uh, and, and we need to, need to remember that. Uh, and the angel took the censer and, and, and he filled it with fire. And then he threw it down to the earth. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there, there's, there's a period of, 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 of destruction there. Uh, now, the, the only thing I get out of that, and, and different ideas on it, 
But these are the prayers of the saints. Re remember, in, in, uh, whenever the fifth uh, seal was broken, you had the martyrs under the altar crying out, how long, how long, how long? Uh, and, and now you have these prayers, you know, and, and, and are thrown down to the earth. And the idea is prayer does work. You know, these prayers are mixed with fire. God hears the prayers, and he's going to take vengeance upon those that are persecuting uh, his, uh, his people. Uh, and then uh, you, you have the, the trumpets that are about to be blown. And the trumpets announce God's judgment, his judgments upon the world. Uh, God is going to deal with, with evil. Uh, he's in control. And these aren't final judgments uh, because only a third of, of the earth is going to be affected. Uh, in the final judgment, the entire world is going to be infected. Uh, these, these are warnings. You know, a seal, uh, when it is broken, it conceals. A trumpet is to warn. And these trumpets are warning about things that are ahead. We have the first trumpet there in chapter 8, and you pictured are fire and hail mixed with blood, probably the blood of the enemy. Uh, God sends his plagues upon evil men. And then you have the second trumpet, and there's something like a, a great mountain that's burning uh, and cast into the sea. Now in the Old Testament, mountains sometimes referred to nations. And he could be talking about nations here, specifically the nation of Rome that persecuted the, the, the church. Uh, and uh, this could also be, uh, be a picture of judgment uh, on, on Rome's great presence on the sea. They relied upon the sea for their commerce, and, and also they relied upon the sea for their conquering of other nations. And, uh, and that all was going to be stopped at some time. History would even bear that out. So maybe that's what he's talking about. The third trumpet, there's a great star that falls from heaven. And the star is called Wormwood. And Wormwood uh, detects bitterness. There's going to be uh, bitterness. Um, and uh, also uh, the fresh water of the earth, the, not the sea, not the salt water, but the fresh water is going to be affected too. And uh, the... This might show often um, pagans, uh, they worship their false gods and they, and they worship rivers uh, and they worship nature and it could be, uh, it could be a, a judgment upon them. Fourth trumpet uh, sounds and you have a third of the sun, the moon, the stars were struck. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's uh, some great disaster, it's hard to tell what it is. But if you look at verse 13 in chapter 8, I've got to get over to the book of Revelation. Look, look at the, the 8th chapter and look at verse 13. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying. And some of your versions may say angel there. Um, then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. And it seems like John is saying, you haven't seen anything yet. And, and the whole idea is that God is in control and he's going to take vengeance upon evildoers and you can count on it. Uh, okay, this brings us then uh, to, to chapter 9. Uh, and and look, at, look at verse 1 here. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given uh, to him. Uh, a lot of theories about this, uh, what, the, what this star represents. Uh, some people think, well, it refers to Nero. Nero, uh, you know, shows that he, 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 he has fallen, you know. There are a couple different uh, uh, theories as to when the book of Revelation was written. Some believe that it was written prior uh, to the fall of uh, uh, to the fall of Jerusalem, in A.D. 70. Uh, I think that more people feel like it was written toward the end of the century. But some of the people who uh, who believe that it was written uh, to to describe the fall of Jerusalem 
believe that it was written prior to, to AD 70, but that's beside the point. Some people say, well, this refers to Nero. Others say, well, it refers to Satan. Satan's going to be conquered. Satan is going to be conquered. There are a lot of uh, ideas about uh, the devil, Satan, and uh, and you know, really, we don't have a lot of information about about his uh, about his beginning. Uh, you know, the idea is well, he was once in heaven. He got kicked out of heaven. He was one of those angels that that sinned. You know. That very well could be. But I want us to look at a couple of verses. One is in um, Isaiah 14. Uh, look, at, look at Isaiah 14. And look at, uh, if you will, verse 12. Isaiah 14, and verse 12. Okay, in Isaiah 14, in, in verse 12, you, you find the following words. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. Uh, and uh, if you're reading the King James or the New King James, instead of saying uh, morning star or star of the heaven, you have the word uh, Lucifer there, how you have fallen Lucifer. And uh, Lucifer is, is not a, uh, a Hebrew word at all. It, it actually comes from, from Latin. Um, and uh, about the fourth century AD, uh, Jerome uh, translated uh, the, uh, the Bible uh, into, into Latin. It became the Latin Vulgate became the became the Bible of the of the Roman Church. Uh, he did a good job of translating it, but but he put word the, the word Lucifer here stayed in the King James and in, in the New King James. Uh, and uh, more than likely, uh, this is talking about Babylon. You know, this is this is the star that's falling. It it fits the context of Isaiah. Uh, now another another verse then that people look at would be Luke chapter ten and verse eighteen. Uh, look at look at Luke ten. And in Luke ten, look at uh, down at verse eighteen, uh, and and uh, uh, Jesus is, is speaking here, and he said to them. I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And so uh, some people say, well, he, he did, he, he got kicked out of heaven, you know. And we knew, do know that there were angels that sinned that did get cast uh, into, into a place called hell, uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 4. And uh, so uh, it's possible that Satan once lived in heaven there are conservative people that think he never did, that he was evil from the very beginning, that he didn't, uh, didn't ever reside in heaven, you know. And these are, these are, Jesus could just be speaking about the demise of Satan, that his power, and I saw Satan falling, you know. He's, he's not going to have the power that he once had. That could be what he's saying simply. Uh, okay, uh, I'm... I wanted to, uh, I'll try not to review as much next time, but uh, we, we will start with the questions in uh, next, uh, next uh, Wednesday night uh, and uh, go from there. We'll have our announcements here in a few minutes. Good evening to each and every one of you and those that are with us on Facebook for our Wednesday evening study. I'm 
encourage you to silence your electronic devices, if you would, please. Nursery to the left as you exit the auditorium. And our schedule is 9.30 for Sunday morning and 5.30 for Sunday afternoon, and of course Wednesday night at 7. Run through the announcements. I uh, have an addition or two, I guess, there. Mac Latham got to come home from the hospital last week. Keith Clark's daughter is diagnosed with melanoma, and surgery is planned for this is Thursday, yet tomorrow. But tomorrow, Thursday? I mean, tomorrow's Thursday, but is that correct? Okay, and Evan is next here and he says he will, uh, Art mentioned October, he moved his, um, and he's doing, Junior said doing well, he's just waiting, he's still in quarantine. Uh, we had Olin Haynes in the hospital Sunday. And then, uh, let's see, that's what's in the announcements, and we had uh, Louise Banks, she got to come home. And uh, Scott Giles got to come home. Camille is still scheduled on schedule for the 19th for uh, knee replacement. And uh, Frances Herring, Mary Storm's mother, she's in the hospital still in St. Uh, Bernard's, doing better than when she went in. She's still, uh, I think, sounds like in serious condition there. Uh, Christy Cooper, this is, you said Ron, Ron's daughter, this is Ron's daughter, they passed, and also maybe Neely, and I don't, we didn't have any announcement, any times or anything there uh, for that. Uh, okay, we mentioned, the baby shower was mentioned, and of course it was to be, and have been, I guess, Sunday afternoon, but it was canceled, and if you had anything, well, you can still leave them, leave it in the fellowship building and also uh, instead of a wedding shower for Casey and Hart and Taylor Williams, there'll be a bridal box in the foyer for the next two Sundays for gifts for them. And I think that's all I have written down. Is, is there anything that we've that I've missed or I hadn't been hasn't been told that we need to say? If not, get your songbook and join with Wes. He's going to lead us in a song or two. Charlie's going to bring us a lesson tonight. Lance has a closing prayer, and now Philip will lead us. Let's bow together. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to Thee for life and all of its blessings. Thankful, Father, for everything that we have, and always, Father, help us to, to remember that you are the creator of all these things. We're very thankful, Father, for the love that you've shown for us in sending thy Son to die on the cross so that we might have the hope of spending eternity with thee in heaven. Pray, Father, that you be with each of us as we attempt to return that love to thee by keeping your commandments. We're thankful, Father, for the country that we live in and all the freedoms that we have. We ask, Father, that you would be with those that serve our country to ensure that we have these freedoms. Be with those, Father, in the armed services. Keep them safe as they do their duties. We're very thankful, Father, for those that labor on your behalf. Thankful, Father, for those that work here with us and in this country and we're very thankful father for those that are willing to work in foreign fields pray father that you would continue to be with them give them strength and courage so that your work would continue in these places keep them safe as they do their duties and help us father to do all the things that we can to aid them in this work We're thankful, Father, for our health, and we pray, Father, for the health of others. Especially, Father, do we pray for those that were mentioned here tonight as being sick. 
We ask, Father, <coughs> be your will, restore them back to their normal health once again. We're thankful, Father, for our families, and we pray, Father, for the families that have lost loved ones. We pray, Father, that you would be a comfort to them in this time of sorrow. Continue, Father, to be with us as we live our lives. Be a guide to us and let us be good examples to those that we're in contact with from day to day in this community. We realize, Father, that we do sin, and we ask, Father, at this time that you would forgive us of those sins. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you'd like to uh, turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 14, in a few minutes we're going to uh, look at some verses there, and, and after we look at those verses we're going to 
look in Daniel chapter 3. So if you want to uh, uh, be finding those. Have you uh, ever met or known someone that was really famous? And before you raise your hands, I don't mean someone that's famous here in Greene County. Uh, have you known someone that was famous nationally? Uh, and that would include uh, heads of state or major league ball players or something like that. Well, I don't know that I have. Uh, but if you have and you and you liked that person or thought they were good, you probably would remember that the rest of your life. And maybe you'd get a picture or two of it or, or, or something like that. Uh, and that person, uh, if he was a good person or a bad person, might be an influence on you for years to come. Uh, as I said, I don't know that I've met anybody famous. My dad, in the mid-1960s, was on a national dairy co-op organization, on a board member, and they had a convention in Texas, and uh, then-President Lyndon Johnson was there. And after that meeting, uh, he actually took some of those board members to his farm and uh, I guess hauled them around in a little bus and showed them around and dad said he actually got out and opened the gate when we went into the farm. And he remembered and, and laughed about that. Um, Amber, my daughter, and Sharon, my wife, along with two other mothers and two other daughters, went to New York City in 2003 and saw the sights. And at the airport, they ran into famous ball players. Some of you may not, if you're young, you might not know, Joe Namath. And uh, they got pictures with him and, uh, and uh, everything. He was referred to as Broadway Joe back in the day. So someone in my family have met famous people, but fortunately we don't have to meet people that we admire in person. We can meet them in books that's written about them. If, uh, for instance, you wanted to know about Albert Einstein, there's volumes written about him, or Abraham Lincoln, or John Lennon, or Princess Diana, or George Washington, or Hitler, or Mussolini. You can find out probably all you want to know about them from books. Now, and I didn't ask you to raise your hand uh, a, a while ago, I guess I asked you not to. Uh, has anyone ever met or known a famous person that is, by famous I mean nationally known, that is a Christian? That on the day of judgment you'd like to be standing right by him or her? Well that list is smaller. There's lots of famous people written about in books. But if you want to find famous good people, uh, you just really need to look in one book, and that's the Bible. Uh, if you want to know about Abraham, or Moses, or Joshua, or Caleb, or the three Hebrew children, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel, Enoch, Peter, Paul, then their story is told in the Bible, and they're not only famous, they're good and famous. 
these are the people that we should be looking at for examples on how to live and how to conduct our lives. Uh, if you want to look at Numbers chapter 14 and look beginning about verse 6, there's two men that are famous and good men. And I want to read those verses and not really comment much about them. Just listen to what is said. And in the context of the story is that 12 spies were sent into the promised land. And it's a story we all know. Ten of them gave a bad report. Two gave a good report. Because the people didn't believe Joshua and Caleb, they all all the adults spent 40 more years in the wilderness and died and didn't get to go in. But if you will read with me these verses and I'm reading tonight from the New King James. This is after the 10 spies have given the bad report. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Japunath, who were among those who had spied out the land tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Those are two men we need to try to act like, to be like. Now, if you will, uh, look at Daniel chapter 3. And we'll start reading... Uh, at verse 15. And the context here is, as you know, it's a, a very uh, well known story. Nebuchadnezzar, he uh, made a golden image and told all the people when they heard music, certain kinds of music play, to bow down and worship that image. And these three Jewish young men didn't do it. And Nebuchadnezzar evidently liked them. He gave them another chance. And if you will, read along with me in the beginning at, at verse 15. And Nebuchadnezzar is talking to them and giving them a, another chance because he really doesn't want to kill them. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands. He's going to find out in a minute. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this manner. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. And again, those are three famous men that we need to try to be like. Now I've got one more scripture uh, I'd like for you to look at uh, Acts chapter 5. And we're going to look beginning at about verse 25. And while you're turning there, 
it's another familiar story. The apostles were thrown in prison for preaching. The high priest and the Jews didn't like it. And they were put in prison and during the night an angel came and released them without anyone knowing it and told them to go to the temple and preach and they did. And the next morning the apostles couldn't be found. And the guards and the Jews didn't really know what to make of it, and I'm paraphrasing here. And so while they were wondering what was going on, someone came and told them. So if you will, let's begin reading in verse 25 and, and read through 29. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them out without violence, for they feared the people, lest they be, should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to preach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Again, a group of men that we should try to be like. And I don't know about you, but I'm not always like that. But fortunately, we can go to God in prayer when we fail and be forgiven. There's possibly that there's someone here tonight that has a need that we could help you with. If so, you can come while we stand and sing. Jesus is calling, calling, calling. Jesus is calling today. Why should I linger, linger, linger? I will arise and away. They are so happy, happy, happy. Who do their Savior obey? Why should I linger? for this day. Lord, we're thankful for the blessings of it. Lord, we are so thankful for your grace. We thank you for all the things that we receive that we know that we don't deserve. And Lord, we are thankful for your mercy, for your forgiveness, for giving us what we should receive. Lord, we ask that you would be with those that have been mentioned tonight. We ask that you would uh, be with those that are sick. We ask that uh, you would be with those that are seeing to their needs and ministering to their health. And if it be your will, you would return them to a better measure of health. Lord, we are so sorry to hear of those that, have, that we have lost. And we ask that you would be with the families of those that are grieving at this time. 
Lord, we ask that you would be with us in our daily endeavors. We ask that you would help us to not do necessarily the popular thing, and to, uh, but to do the right thing. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for our sins when we come repenting. And Lord, we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.